All right, guys, welcome to the Metal Deacon. Uh, it's a good day today because you don't have to listen to me uh, the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> That's always good, at least for me. Uh, yeah, so uh, I got no other than Jason Wisdom with me here today. And to me, it has always been more interesting to hear who people are uh, according to themselves or than to hear somebody else's uh, uh, interpretation of who they think <laughs> you are. Uh, sometimes that turns into gossip. So uh, if you don't mind me asking you, Jason, who are you? Yeah, um, well, uh, to to almost everybody in the world, I'm, <laughs> I'm a dad uh, of two kids. I have a one-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son and married to my wife for nine years now. Nice. And um, I play, play bass guitar in the worship team at church and um, I love theology and apologetics and um, talking about the Lord and things like that and making music um, to a few people in the world. I am the former lead singer of Becoming the Archetype, uh, a heavy metal band and uh, now the singer for a band called Death Therapy, which is an industrial metal band and um, yep. I'm somebody who's very grateful for those few people that are out there that appreciate that. Awesome, yeah, that's that's good stuff. <laughs> so, so yeah, we we almost did a, an interview um, at Audio Feed Festival um, a couple of weeks ago when you played there with uh, Death Therapy. Right. Played uh, on three different stages, and to me personally, it was just I really missed hearing your your live vocals. <laughs> awesome, so uh, I really enjoyed the therapy. I miss doing it. So, okay, cool. Well, I'm I'm glad you're you're back in the game. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I think before we get more into the music stuff, I think on behalf of all of Denmark, I need to uh, to give you an apology. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you. Uh, I know you used to play a bunch of shows with Becoming the Archetype. Do you remember mm -hmm. playing? In a small, uh, uh, at a small bar in a basement in uh, central Copenhagen, together with the chariot, about ten years ago. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah. So so I just uh, I feel a little sorry for you because our must pitch uh, get a little bit you know out of hand and uh, I lost yeah. count how many times we punched you in the face with the microphone. Oh, it was okay. That's okay. Okay. That was a lot of fun. Honestly, um, you know, I have very fond memories of Denmark and um, would absolutely love to go back there and play again as soon as possible. So. All right. Cool. No, no hard feelings. No, no hard apology feelings. needed. All right. <laughs> Good. I just have to get that out of uh, off my chest. It's okay. As a as a heavy metal singer, it's okay if the crowd is having so much fun that they knock the microphone into you. It's that's that's a good problem to have um, it's, it's a bad problem when you show up at a venue somewhere and they don't have the power grounded properly for the equipment and you your mouth touches the microphone and it electrocutes you which yeah. that has happened many times so I don't mind the microphone hitting me because people are having fun I just don't like the microphone shocking me for no reason <laughs> other than cheap equipment yeah okay yeah uh, I follow <laughs> that yep so yeah and to me uh, I don't think I ever told you this, but to me, uh, when Becoming the Archetype uh, released Terminate Damnation 2005, I bought it at Nordic <laughs> Festival. Uh, that actually restored my faith in uh, metal. So it, it's no small awesome. compliment. Where, yeah, I, I was, sometimes I get into these uh, drafts where I just get tired of music, and, and I had for a few months or a year that metal was just getting a little tiring. So. So thank you for everything you've done musically too. Definitely. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. That's a great encouragement to hear. So, uh, so uh, but, uh, what I wanted to uh, to hear you uh, explain a little bit about. I know last year you were very much involved in, um, uh, uh, yeah, in a Rifo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm still involved. I'm still involved with Rifo. Yeah. Okay. Which is uh, Rifo is a is an outreach uh, ministry to musicians who are disconnected from the church, um, whether they be on the road. Um, primarily, that's what we do is outreach to musicians on the road through 
Christians opening their homes um, for bands to stay, get showers, food, things like that around the United States and Canada. Um, and I, I, you know, I think there's potentially some doors that could be open to do that over in the over in Europe as well, which would be really cool. Yeah, that would be great. Because um, there's a lot of places that bands go, you know, on the regular circuit um, around there. So, um, but yeah, that's what RIFO does. And um, I, I work for RIFO um, as part of the team and and just kind of, you know, do whatever I can to help um, with chaplaincy and um, ministry and um, reaching out to bands and things like that. So. Okay, yeah, what, uh, what got you involved with that? Um, well, oh. Rifle was a Rifle was a ministry that meant a lot to us when we were on the road with becoming the archetype. Towards the end of our time touring, um, the Rifle is, is about eight years old, eight or nine years old now. So it was towards the end of the time that I was with becoming the archetype touring. Um, but you know, everybody who's been on the road knows that um, it's, there's not a whole lot of money out there, uh, especially if you're an independent kind of band that's um, not you know not a mainstream band making a lot of money so we didn't really have money to afford hotel rooms and things like that so rifo more or less transformed the way we would tour because it gave us a place to stay but the most important thing and this is why i wanted to get involved with something like rifo is because it wasn't just the place to stay um you know it wouldn't have meant as much if people were just giving us money and buying us a hotel room that means a lot but it meant more that people were opening their homes and we were we were more or less being invited into their lives and become developing relationships with those people. So a lot of those people have become friends that we still contact with today. Some, uh, some people that I saw at audio feed festival, um, were people that, you know, they just remembered from when we came and stayed at their house, um, and stuff like that. So that's cool. Very good. Yeah. So, so what, uh, so do you feel, did you feel that you, you owed that or, or was it just, uh, or why do you feel the need to serve other people? Um, you know, poor musicians who who can't really uh, repay you. You, yeah, in Rifo. Uh, yeah. You you have your house. You you do the laundry. You cook their meal. You you pay for everything. They just come and stay at the house, and then they leave again. Or well, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the reason it, it's. The reason it means so much to me, like I said, is because they ministered. In a, but it's not like I feel like I had to give back as much as I resonate with the mission. And I understand the value um, of ministering to the, the, the RIFO slogan or kind of one of the taglines is serving the voices. Mm. And if you think about it, this is the way I put it to a lot of people. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of groups that um, the church is ministering to through outreaches and things like that. But a lot of those outreaches are also things that secular people are also reaching out to. So, for instance, a food ministry. Well, there's secular food pantries and things like that, civic groups that do things like that, um, clothing the homeless. And I'm not saying any of those things are bad. I'm just saying these are things that the church does, but there's also secular groups that do it. And there's government um, subsidies and things that do those sorts of things. But there's there's one humongous cultural group and very, very powerful cultural group um, in our culture that neither the church nor secular people seem to want to take care of. And that is artists mm -hmm. um, seem to use them like both the church and secular people seem to treat artists like, you know, old toilet paper, something you use and then you throw it away. Oh, yeah. um, and it's that's a very, really gross analogy, but it's it gets it gets to the heart of how a lot of musicians feel. Um, you know, we, you know, you go out on the road, you play your show and then you get back in the van and it can be an incredibly lonely place. It can be a place where you feel like you don't, you know, people see you on stage and they think, Oh, this is just a wonderful. It must be the life to be a musician, rock and roll on stage with the lights on. But, um, a lot of people who are people of faith, lose their faith on the road. Those stories are out there all over the place. I'm sure you've heard those. And, um, and then, more importantly, just think of the impact that all of those people who are making the music have on the culture as a whole. Um, yeah. So anyway, that that's it's something that I really resonate with the the mission and the and the need for it. Um, and it's one of those things where it's like, I, I love ministry. I love, you know, I love studying 
and teaching and and things like that. But I've never seen myself as a pastor um, in like a you know a paid full time pastor position. Hmm. So this is more of a good fit for me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's a uh, yeah. I, I love what uh, Rifa does, and it has uh, here where my wife and I live. We've had the yeah, been fortunate enough to have enough space to have band stay. But also when we lived in yeah. a two bedroom apartment, we had a couple of bands stay and and it's just to me it's yeah. It it just gives so much. That is yeah. uh, that is awesome. And I I really like the uh, yeah, thank you for sharing your thoughts on uh, on serving in that capacity too and serving the voices because uh, I think it, to me it's uh, it's important to get my horizon broadened to uh, the different ways to serve uh, and just uh, make people aware of uh, we all we all humans we all there to uh, with needs and the musicians right. and the artists that it's a neglected group. Well, it's it, the thing is the artists, musicians, artists. It's almost like part of the job description that they're disconnected from everything we all take for granted, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, especially if they're on the road, they're disconnected from family, they're disconnected from friends, they're disconnected from life and routine, they're disconnected from um, church, family, they're disconnected from all those things that we we take for granted and we don't think of how important they are to our, you know, to our daily life. I've heard people use the analogy before, like, um, you don't think of how important your big toe is on your foot until it's broken or until mm. it gets cut off and then you realize it's you need that <laughs> for everything else you need it for everything else you do and so something very small is is very important and so um things like you know like I, I just got back from the grocery store things like normal trips to the to and from the grocery store or time with your wife or time with your kids um those may seem like normal mundane routine things and the rock and roll is like that's the fun thing that's the cool you know that's what everybody wants to do, but it can it can feel it can feel more isolating. And um, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll is a cliche for a reason. Um, there are mm -hmm. people who get out on the road, and it may seem like they're just partying, and that's why they're having sex, drugs, and rock and roll. But a lot of times, it's people out on the road who find themselves hopelessly empty and um, needing something to fill that. So, so what I'm trying to say is. Um, I'm not trying to say, hey, everybody who's doing other ministries should jump in um, and start doing ministry to artists, but I am trying to say that I think a lot of people who have a heart that would resonate with this haven't ever considered, hey, I could minister to these people. Um, mm -hmm. It's very it's very easy, especially for church people, to look at artists as um, spoiled kids with hobbies. Um <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, why don't they come home and get a real job like the rest of us? And but then those same people hop in their car and sing along to their favorite song on the radio, you know, or, or come back and read their favorite book or watch their favorite television show. And and they don't appreciate that there are people who are giving their life, in a sense, um, to create those things um, that make, you know, that make life you know, worth living, <laughs> make life exciting and fun, yeah. you know, music and art and entertainment. Um, you know, those aren't, those are things that make life sweeter. They're like the icing on the cake. So anyway. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's good. Thank you so much. Yeah. I heard yep. the term, it's cold on the top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I guess that can be, if you're in the spotlight, people see you Yeah, on the top. Uh, all right. Thank you. Do you have anything else to, uh, on your mind, you want to share to the world? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, just in that in that same sort of vein, um, the world has really changed with the way um, social media has has almost created like a like all these different layers of a celebrity culture. So um, when I go to audio feed, for instance, there are people who come up to me and they're like. Oh my gosh! I can't believe you're here. You're like you're like the, my favorite singer of all time. And what those people a lot of times fail to realize is, when I go home, I'm struggling to pay the bills. I'm, you know, arguing with my wife. I'm, you know, having to try to discipline my kids. I'm, li you know what I mean? I'm living a normal, <laughs> I'm living a normal life. I don't float around on a cloud 
um, <laughs> and 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 just make music and like it's all it's all wonderful. So I'm, you know, I, I think it's very important, um, in particular, for people to start to like. If you're a fan of music, like let's say. I'm just, you know, just pick any band that you're, say you're a really big fan of that band and they make a huge impact on your life. I would say, I think, I think fans should look, this is another thing Rifo says is we're looking for different brand of fan. We're looking for people who would, you know, say, Hey, I'm not just looking to take from this artist, but how can I give back? Uh, and I think a lot of times if those people were to look it up, they'd realize, Hey, my favorite artist is, you know, Crimson Moonlight or, or, you know, whoever you want to name it. And, and these guys struggle to get enough money to go and record, you know, an EP or something like that. Well, that sucks. You know, they're, they're like one of my favorite bands. How, yeah. how can I, how can I help? How can I help them? Um, not like give them a handout, but show them, Hey, you know, you're, what you're doing really makes an impact. Um, because, you know, like what you just told me about our first, our first album, you know, in my day to day life, I can hear my daughter crying over in the other room right now. In my day-to-day -day life, I don't think of, you know, I don't I don't think about that. I don't think oh there's people who were in Denmark or in South Africa or other parts of the world that this music mattered to. Mm. Um, I think of it as well that's something I did a long time ago and um, you know, <laughs> nobody knows what nobody knows or nobody cares. Um, so not like a pity not like a not like trying to throw a pity party, but I'm saying it's oh, sure. um Yeah, I it's understand. Yeah, I guess I guess it's just in the past like thirty years or so, it's completely changed the the way these things work. Like it's there's everybody's got a band, everybody's got a website, everybody's got a blog, everybody's got a you know a, an everything, and so if you're a fan of something, it's important to give back. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, mm. So that you so to keep being there. Yeah, see the people behind. Yeah. The face. Yeah. Cool. And then. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, then I'd like to just uh, throw in an ad. So uh, uh, what would you like people to know about um, death therapy? What's the most important thing about death therapy? That yeah, um, death, know? Therapy is, is death therapy is my new band. Uh, I'm going in to do a full-length album very soon. Um, so far, we've got some demos up online that you can find either on YouTube or at Bandcamp or deaththerapy.org. Um, it's... Uh, it's just something I've been trying to do just because I need, I need to make music. I'm not making yeah. music. Uh, <laughs> you know, you know, you will know how that is. And there's uh, other people that would hear yeah. this and shake their head and go, okay, yeah, I know how that is. Yeah. Um, I'm not making music to make money. Obviously. Um, I'm not making music to be cool. <laughs> obviously. Um, I'm making, I'm making music because I can't help, um, but do it. So, um, it's been fun and it's been different because with previous, um, efforts, whether Solo Moors, which I did in 2013 with Alex Kennis, uh, who was in Becoming the Archetype and Alethian, or Becoming the Archetype, which I did from 99, 1999 to 2010, 2011. Um, I didn't, I didn't have a huge hand in writing the music. Um, I did all the vocals, but with Death Therapy, it's it's me writing <laughs> everything pretty much, and um, so it's fun, and I'm looking forward to it. I, I would just say for you know people who like you know, groovy, heavy, industrial, kind of dark, um, you know, Nine Inch Nails meets Rage Against the Machine with Becoming the Archetype singing, <laughs> then then check it out. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Cool, to, Thank you. Thanks from the middle deacon to the middle dad. <laughs> middle dad, yep, that's me. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you so much, Jason. Thanks, ma'am. Cool. Appreciate it.